This is Groove Talk with Froggy Style. I think the biggest skill that any broadcaster or podcaster, I guess with the same thing really, um, can have is making it feel, making you as a person feel real and making everything else just seem like a normal human interaction. Yeah. Because like, even you look at like, just I'll look at radio specifically, you'll have people that are like, they use um, like an oldie station. It's a lot of like, mm, yeah, it's 27 minutes past, b -b 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 past the hour. You know, dear it's getting messy. We're gonna get messy with Bruce Springsteen. Q107 or yeah. whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and it just feels very, not no one talks like that yeah exactly right? it's dumb <laughs> yeah. yeah and that's another thing about podcasts too is like who would have thought that like like in, with the culture that we live in like it's such like a instant gratification culture you know what I mean like small small clips like 30 second videos are what's hot yeah you like, know? A, like a quick Instagram hit yeah. or like a Twitter video yeah, yeah exactly totally. so who would have thought <laughs> three hour conversations would be such a huge thing you know what I mean <laughs> oh yeah well that's why even with like the one that really loves Dungeons and Dragons is because you have you know up until god even like eight years ago when like Adventure Zone or like Acquisitions Incorporated started, like D and D as a thing was just not. It didn't seem. It didn't seem uh, portable. Yeah. Because it's four hours of like constant, just stuff happening, and who has that attention span? Yeah. It turns out a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that like people appreciate like just being given the opportunity. You know what I mean? To be like. Well, yeah, I do want four hours of content or whatever, like interruption-free and stuff like that. And it's like something that's never really existed before. Like the closest thing you could get was a movie, and a movie, like a long movie, is two hours, two and a half hours, and that's completely uninterrupted. That's almost changing now, though, because like even that garbage Fast and Furious Hobbs and Shaw piece of shit. Sorry, can I swear? Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Okay, good. even that fucking Fast and Furious Hobbs and Shaw piece of shit. It was such, it was two hours and 17 minutes. Oh, wow. It was terrible. It wasn't even worth like Tuesday afternoon matinee money. Um, and now that was like, okay, all right. I mean, Avengers was three, Lord of the Rings, the extended cuts were four and a half. Yeah. That's like, I think that's my, for one sitting, for a movie, that's like my maximum is Lord of the Rings, extended edition, Return of the King. <laughs> it's so long. It's so, it's so long. needlessly long. It's so but long. also you get like goofy old Tom Bombadil just like nature in it up at the end, <laughs> yeah. which is fun. Yeah. Tom Bombadil is the best character in Lord of the Rings. And I will fight anyone that tells me differently. <laughs> I think that like one, I, it was a, a couple of years ago, but I just watched all the, the extended editions in one sitting. And wait, wait, like in one day? One day, yeah. No! <laughs> that's, so, that's so much fantasy nerd shit. That's yeah. so much. <laughs> From like basically when I got out to when I went to bed, it was just Lord of the Rings. Oh my god. I did have one D&D &D day that was, I think it was 10 hours and 48 minutes by the end of it. Wow. And I was DMing it. Wow. And I think the next, I think I went home and I sat down on the stair and I fell asleep, like, leaning up against, like, my railing. And and I, well, I got up at 2, and my girlfriend was like, no, I'm, I, honestly, you just were dead. I just left you. <laughs> and then, yeah, I think I slept for, like, 10 hours afterwards because, like, watching a thing is something, but, like, even, like, playing it and getting involved or, like, crafting the story is just like, all right, I'm, I've been doing stage theater for 10 hours. <laughs> this is the line. Yeah, especially DMing it. Like, playing it, like, is a little different, but when you're DMing, like, I don't know about the D&D groups that you DM for, but the one that I do specifically, they're all my friends, and they just give me such a hard time. <laughs> it goes back and forth. Like, there's a definite, like, love-hate relationship. Like, because I know I, with my one DM, because I have a game I run and a game I play in, and uh, my friend Fraser's are DM the game I play. And we're, like, really RP-heavy. We're all, act like, we're all former actors, and, like, performers in some way yeah so like it gets a little weird um but after a while like you can tell like Fraser's starting to get a little exhausted with us <laughs> and we're like do we let up no no fuck with them more keep going yeah. and then my players do it to me I'm like I deserve this this yeah. is this is something that I have brought on myself yeah. <laughs> in the gaming universe yeah anytime I play because like one of my friends who's in my group right now he also dms and I'm in his group 
and like every time he gives me a hard time I'm just like ah oh, and then I'm like oh yeah I'm like literally the worst player to DM for so I <laughs> oh no do you like, are you a murder hobo <laughs> no I'm like I, uh, okay one of my characters was a rogue and his thing was he just stole everything okay yeah so like it's a no, great rogue trope yeah as it should be yeah it's, it's, no but like no matter what it's like can I steal that or whatever but I didn't really, I made him like an RP kind of juggernaut, you know? I didn't focus too much on damage and I put like all my stuff into like charisma and oh, stuff. Oh, so. that, I love, I, those are my favorite characters to both play for and to play. Yeah. Like I'm in the midst of writing a character right now, because um, in the game I play and I, I fucked up real bad. <laughs> We're in a dicey spot and I realized I'm away from the party. I'm a warlock and I've already used one of my spells. So I got one spell slot left. Because in Warlocks, you get, like, two. Yeah, you get two. <laughs> uh, or three if you get really far in. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, like, alone. There's a demon being summoned. There's, like, a shit ton of cultists just culting around. <laughs> and I'm alone. So, like, I started writing a new character just in case this one goes bad. And for the first time ever, I'm like, I'm not going to put any points in Charisma because I want to see how that's a challenge for me as a player. Yeah. Which is something I've never done before. So that's, like nerve-wracking but exciting because you can still be like a charismatic player without being a charisma based character yeah that makes sense yeah yeah no it does and I get uh, the way that we used to play it was like sort of opposite from the way we're playing now is when we first got into it because we played we started on fourth edition which is fucking terrible exactly <laughs> <laughs> the only good thing about fourth edition was the skill challenges yeah. and that's the all I've kept those for my game everything else is fucking trash yeah the fourth edition thing was just like it felt like it was way too combat based and not a lot of like it wasn't didn't it was definitely like a throwback to like AD and D like yeah. war games yeah and then third kind of, third was real math heavy 3.5 spawned Pathfinder which got a little bit better yeah um, but yeah fourth edition was just like I feel like wizard because I think wizards had just bought it yeah before they got to into fourth edition um, and. I feel like they just didn't know what to do with the property. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, because, yeah, but it, sorry, as I derail your whole train of thought. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, fourth edition was fucking terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I feel like they, they hit it on the head with fifth edition, though. Like, it's ama it's, it's, it takes everything I've, I loved about the game since playing like 3.5 and 4 yeah. and made it easier, they made it accessible, yeah. and they, and they like, the, the, the barrier entry became so much lower yeah. that. There's not a single person like in this room that I could be like, I can't teach them D&D. Yeah, like, exactly. we could. You could, exactly, yeah. And like, I did try, uh, we did try playing Pathfinder, uh, which is based off 3.5, and like, it was fun, but like, when you get into it, when you really get into it, you realize that they've like, they've almost kind of, there's too much going on. There's a lot of math, yeah. and there's a lot of situational things yeah. that are for very specific nuggets. Have yeah. you played Tested Pathfinder 2? No. Okay, it's a little better, okay. um, but it's still very much for like the math nerd. Yeah. Um, not that's like a derogatory thing, just like the people who grow math, you awesome, do that. Yeah. Um, but the character sheet's goddamn landscape, <laughs> yeah. and it's the fucking worst. I don't want a landscape character sheet. Go away. Yeah. Why would you do that even? Like? No one knows. You gotta go into your printer and switch a setting. And no, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> We're not printing off a custom character sheet, goddammit. Yeah. It's too much work. <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. I feel like we just derailed the pod into like d, &D nerd stuff. <laughs> That's cool. I really like d, &D so. <laughs> I guess that maybe... I guess we're like 10 minutes in, so I guess why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, hi, hello. <laughs> uh, so my name's Graham Oseman. Um, I, I guess I identify largely as a, uh, like a mental health advocate, um, a tabletop role player, uh, and then, yeah, my day job, I guess night job, uh, I work at X929 Calgary's Alternative. Um, I talk between records, and I and I do that for a living, and that's what pays for my my stupid D and D tattoos. <laughs> and oh yeah, I have, a, I have a D20 on me as well. Yes! Oh my god! Well, I got, so I just got this. I was in Seattle, and I was like, "Dude, Wizards of the Coast is based here. I'm getting a D20." But I was talking to my tattoo artist. He was like, "Dude, I do nerdy shit all the time. Like half 
Like, and he was listing off some of the staff that had been tattooed by him, and I'm like, oh, there's the same brother. Just all excited because he, he t- tattooed Kay Welsh, which is super fucking cool because yeah. she's she's brought such a wonderful storytelling life into, into D&D. So yeah, that's where I pay for my stupid D&D tattoos. Like my beholder, whose name is Kevin. He's a nerd. Nice. Uh, and then yeah, all my other stuff. So yeah, I, I, I'm on the radio talking in between records. Cool. So that's me, that's that's what I do. Nice. So uh, is radio something that you always wanted to do or? Oh my God, yeah, since I was like a tiny kid. Yeah. Um, I had one period this sounds like a bit, it kind of half is, but like legitimately I wanted to be a dinosaur. Because <laughs> the dinosaurs are the coolest, it's amazing. I was, I, mean, I was born in the early 90s. Yeah. So like I'm still a baby, but like Jurassic Park came out like right in those kind of formative years. So I want to be a dinosaur and then a paleontologist. And then I realized at like eight, that you had to be like really smart to do that. And I really, I'm, I'm not, I, I got my moments. I was a real mediocre student, which is not like good for paleontology. Uh, and so my like my parents split up when I was like I, mean, I don't know one or two. So like, I'm a broken homie, and all my all my time with my dad in the summer, uh, he was a truck driver because like single dad. How do you get to your kids if they're sick at school? You drive truck. Yeah. So all of my time was spent like driving with my dad to school in the summers. I think he very aggressively flout child labor labor laws and pay me 10 bucks a day to throw straps which for an eight hour shift is bullshit dad come on be better but all we do is listen to the radio okay and so i was always really excited for the sports show to start at two o'clock yeah uh because we the only sports we could really afford were the edmonton eskimos yeah um was to go to that so I fell in love with football. I fell in love with broadcasting. So yeah, I just I always wanted to be in radio, and my whole goal was to be in sports until I got so I went to Nate in Edmonton for broadcasting school. Yeah. Um, so I'm born in Stony Plain, this little town outside of there, and I realized this is not a shot at like my classmates or anything, but the people that wanted to do sports, I was like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> no, I don't need this. This is not for me. And so I shot a resume off to this uh, uh, Edmonton's alternative music station, yeah. uh, Sonic 1029, okay. and uh, they were the first station to call me back. Was like, yeah, you want to come in and like interview to be on our intern army? <laughs> and we wore these like bright orange jackets and would like give out prizes at events and shake hands and just be around. Be like, radio's cool, guys. High <laughs> five. Yeah. And that's right. Yeah. And after that, like I went through radio school doing that and. and so yeah, that's how I got into the FM side of okay. things. But yeah, I was I was gonna be like AM talk radio, that kind of world, yeah. and uh, I've ended up very far away from that. <laughs> nice. And very far away from a dinosaur as well. So. I mean, okay, I do play, again as we've well established, D and D is a very strong love. Yeah. There's stat clocks for dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. I can RP a T Rex. Yeah. It can happen. It's funny that you went through that arc because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a dinosaur at first, T-Rex or a Velociraptor, and then I wanted to be an archaeologist, and then... Oh, so you went with humans as opposed to, like, the actual dinosaur no, I thought that archaeology was for dinosaurs, <laughs> and then I realized that it was paleontology, and then I was like, oh, no, I want to be a paleontologist. <laughs> I had a similar reaction. I was like, oh, you need to be really smart to do that. No, uh, I'm over it. I'm done. Mediocre student here. <laughs> well, yeah, like, it was, it was, I mean, a friend of mine actually went to, there was a paleontology program you can take to the U of A. Mm-hmm. And we lost contact about five years ago. It was too bad. Really nice guy. And last time I, t- I spoke to him, he had gotten a a residency kind of research grant in um, in Dinosaur Provincial Park. Okay. So not like Drumheller proper, but like just kind of outside there, a little more southern. And yeah, he owned the last thing I thought. He was like renting a farmhouse and then going out and like looking at just digging up bones and stuff. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so like yeah, he followed his dream. I don't know if he ever wanted to be a dinosaur, but like it's it's a path for people if you want to chase them. Yeah, which is very cool. Yeah, no, it totally is. It's just I think at somewhere, you know, somewhere in junior high or something, it kind of lost that uh, same appeal that it had for me when I was a kid. So, and then I went through a lot of like I don't know aimless wandering and stuff as most <laughs> as most millennials do yeah, yeah. There's, it's well, as I think about just like yeah being a millennial and you know I've been in my industry now 
uh, I have been engaged in either like schooling for broadcasting or broadcasting proper since 2011. Oh wow! So like I'm I'm almost at a decade now, yeah. and I am 26 years old, yeah. uh, which is bonkers. Like I, I was really lucky and found like my job, the thing I wanted to do, you know, at you know nine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I was getting beat up for doing play-by-play of oh, and Chad passes it to Steven with the basketball. <laughs> Mr. Johnson's looking real grumpy. That should be a foul. Like getting beaten up for calling play-by-play in high school, like not even junior high basketball. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I liked that. It's yeah. uh, it's cool. It's a sweet job. Like I don't work for a living. I get to hang out and talk about music and, yeah. and cool, and just like try to and just try to make friends through a speaker it's yeah. awesome <laughs> yeah it sounds awesome like I mean did, have you always had a passion for music then as well or not really no. <laughs> um, like that that definitely came kind of later because I was like, I feel like everyone kind of finds their formative music at like what 11 12 where they're like oh this might be my genre my kind of world and they kind of grow off from that like I only listened to classic rock until I was oh my god so I got my first iPod at, when I was in grade eight, which is when what, 13, 14, in around there somewhere. Um, Cause yeah, my dad, me and my dad would drive around and all we would listen to is talk radio, like nothing else. And my, my mom was trying to throw some music in there, but she didn't know what I liked cause I didn't really listen to anything. So it was all you know, kind of classic rock stuff. So like, I think I, I didn't discover things like punk rock until I was in high school. Like, I was a late bloomer. I didn't go to my first concert until I was 18 years old yeah. at uh, at Sonic Boom in Edmonton, yeah. which predated Excess by, like, a, two years, I think. Yeah. So, like, that was my first show ever, and I was already 18. Like, that's pretty <laughs> that's pretty late for a guy who's, like, dived really intensely into music, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, I got hooked on... I got hooked on punk rock with, with some of those early Rise Against records. Yeah. Um, which kicked me off into, like, the Dead Kennedys... Like Black Flag and Bouncing Souls and all that stuff. Um, yeah, when I was like 15, 16, and then when I got my when I got my job working at not even a job it was an employee, it was a, a volunteer gig at Sonic at Edmonton. Like I kind of liked the station because I thought the announcers were funny, but I didn't really pay attention to the music. And I yeah. listened to the music and I loved it. And I got to meet all these super cool people. Like I met. I mean, they were big at the time. Now, like, I met Finger Eleven when I when I was first there, and that was really cool. Um, like, we I met Rivers Cuomo when I was 18 years old because he was in for an interview. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I didn't really get into it super, like until I was like 18, 19, and then I got like, yeah super into punk rock and um, that kind of world. And now all my like my favorite bands are somehow linked to New Jersey in some way, shape, or form, which is really weird. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but yeah. So it was. I was definitely late to the music party, and now like I, I, I mean, I. It's a kind of a cliche to like work in radio, yeah. but like I, I listen to a lot of music and a lot of podcasts, because um, especially in like the kind of alternative universe, like there's so much good shit coming out right now, and even stuff that I, I personally probably wouldn't have found on my own. Yeah. Um, but even I know she's like the kind of in thing right now, but like Billie Eilish is really. Crazy good yeah. um, for a specific style of music. Not something I probably ever would have touched, but it just touches on kind of things I like in music enough. But like, yeah, I can still get behind it if it's even if it's not on my turntable. Yeah, that's so, fair. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. I, again, I feel like our paths were kind of similar. Uh, I didn't get into music until I was like in junior high. My dad gave me an ACDC CD. And he was like, here. And I was like, okay, I'll give this. And I gave me a Guns N' Roses CD. <laughs> and then didn't realize that it had swear words. And he took it away. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that ACDC, that was like, I listened to it so much that I can't listen to ACDC anymore. I'm, dude, I worked, in, I worked in active rock radio. So, like, X is, like, the more alternative side. Yeah. I worked in straight up active, like, yeah, bros, we're here to rock. And we're here to rock your face. Like that was, I worked in those stations for the first half of my radio career. Yeah, yeah. So the amount of times I've had to be like, yeah, we're going to get rock with Thunderstruck in like four minutes on 
Winnipeg's best rock, Power 97. Yeah. Like, that was a, that was a, that was my life. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Wait, was it the ACDC Live album? Yeah, that had, like, all of their yeah, hits? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I had that same CD. Yeah, the two-disc thing. <laughs> yes! Yeah. But, like, this, the, the second disc was way better than the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first one only had a couple good ones, and then, like, the second disc was, like, all of That was the hits, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I listened to that CD so much that I just can't anymore. Um, but yeah, then I got into Rise Against. Yeah. And Rise Against kind of, it made me search out things that were kind of like heavier in a way. That's 100% what, what that band was for me too. Because yeah. I, I got into them right when um, Suffering the Witness came out. Yeah. And, you know, even, it's funny because you compare like, because I feel like Suffer and the Witness was really where Rise Against turned and became more of like a melodic punk band. Yeah. Where like you want to go at, um, you know, Revolutions Per Minute or even Siren Song of the Counterculture. Like that's some that's some gritty stuff. Yeah. And especially that first album was just noise and anger. Yeah. And yeah, that that that's what yeah got me into like Dead Kennedys and, and shit like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. It got me into like punk music and I got into like Dropkick Murphys. And Dropkick Murphys was never one I really got into. Like, yeah. weirdly enough, like, even though they toured together, I don't know how many times, yeah. I've seen them live probably like six times. <laughs> I don't think I've ever sat down and listened to a full Dropkick Murphys record. There's, Murphy's the, one, record. there's the one that I really like. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Blackout Tonight. I think that's what it's called. That's the one that I still listen to. But all, all the other ones are kind of like, eh. Yeah. Eh, but, yeah, it was like Dropkick Murphys, The Clash. Uh, yeah. Like, classic punk like that. I tried the Sex Pistols. They're not really good, but... <laughs> Thank you! The Sex Pistols are not very... Like, I appreciate what they did yeah. for, for like... Um, I'll, I'll, use, I'll use them and... Fo this, this is going to sound weird. Bear with me on this one. I'll use them and Foster People as very good... Like, diff very different sides yeah. of a similar cultural touchstone. Yeah. Where... You know, Foster was at, at a big point where gun control was really starting to become a thing, where they meant that first record was really, really huge. Yeah. Um, thanks to Pumped Up Kicks. And yes, the Sex Pistols were a very, they were a product of the time, which fit perfectly for the time. Yeah. And literally nowhere else. Yeah, no, they're so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't like them. This at makes all. me so happy, thank you. <laughs> like, I listened to them, I was like, is this. Because, you know, especially in high school, you see all the other people, all the other punks in your grade, and they're like, got Sex Pistols stuff on, and you're like, oh, I should be listening to that, obviously. And I'm like, this is garbage. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> so, that was definitely me with Nirvana. Okay. I had a long time where I didn't like Nirvana. I'm still kind of iffy on Nirvana. Mm -hmm. um, but I went to I went to the Mopop Museum in Seattle, which has a huge just Nirvana blog. It would make it would make sense yeah. for the modern pop culture museum, um, and that helped a little bit. But I will say, like with bands like that, I have been poisoned because I spent so much time in Grand Perry's Best Rock, Rock 977. Ooh, it smells like Teen Spirit. Yeah, <laughs> and Nirvana is uh, another one that I don't necessarily get that much. Like, I get what they did, and I get why they're big. Cultural touchstone. It yeah. was that exact moment. Yeah, exactly. And they did a lot for music. They were they came in where at a moment where, like, rock and roll was dying. Yeah. It was, like, the early 90s, or it was the 90s, and it was all that was on, it was Britney Spears, boy bands, weird techno stuff. Like, rock and roll was dying. So I appreciate yeah. what Nirvana did. But I don't know why people like them as much as they do. Still, yeah, well, and, and it, you know, it could be an age thing. I mean, for me, I don't know how you are. I'm 26. 29. Yeah, it's the same, same sort of blob, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Smells Like Teen Spirit has been, like, it came out on, uh, like, April 5th, 1992. Yeah. Um, it's the year I was born. Like, that song has been ubiquitous for my entire life. Like, I'm good. Yeah. Like, it's <laughs> fine. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I really do love about, like, Nirvana is that you know they made that grunge scene obviously what it was and like made the Seattle world you know the in place with you know, like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and, you know all kind of godmothered in thanks to Heart. Yeah. Um, without Nirvana, we wouldn't have had like the antithesis of them on the rock side of like Cardigan Rock of you know Weezer of being like we don't want to be angry guys but like. Yeah, we just want to hang out and like wear our cute shirts and sing about sing about surfing. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so like I, I I yeah like that color sign of the you know kind of lawful neutral 
to their you know chaotic evil of, yeah. of it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> which is what I've always really appreciated about about Nirvana in that yeah. sense. Yeah, no, like I said, I get why they were a big thing, and I get why they're important. It's just like. And smells like Teen Spirit. It's a great song, <laughs> but <laughs> the rest of it is kind of like eh. yeah, and uh, yeah, just a little too depressing. Maybe that's not the right word, but I know, like, no, I know what you mean. Like I can't listen to it like in utero anymore. Yeah, it's just like it just all kind of sounds the same after a while. And yeah, totally. Yeah. Anyways, let's get off the Nirvana train. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's shit on more legendary bands. Come yeah. on, man. Gonna take some flack for that one. Maybe. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then okay, so then in high school I was into straight up metal for a while because I, I I had a I had a summer of being a metal guy. Yeah, yeah. I had one summer. <laughs> it was Sepultura and like Slayer, and then I. Never went there again. Because <laughs> yeah. I just kept getting heavier and heavier, you know. I got into punk and I was like, I want, and then I started getting into like light metal. Mm-hmm. And um, so, like, Rise Against was actually a really big uh, gateway into my metal journey. Yeah, that makes sense. I would imagine that's true for a lot of people. Like, yeah. it's, it's, that band fits in. And I was, you know, I had my first, like, kind of, oh my God, what is my life moment? You know, it was, it was 2014, I was working at uh, a station in Winnipeg. Um, Power 97, and I got Rise Against His Record, the, I want to say it was Wolves, okay. was just coming out, um, or they were in between, either way, but I got a call, I was like, hey, from my boss, I was like, hey, you know, you're like Rise Against, like, we, we can, you want to interview Tim? And I'm like, yes, yes I do. And we had, they like, kind of, we hodgepodge in, because he was in Toronto, so it was over like this IS, it was on the ISDN line, so it sounds like we're in the same room, we weren't. Yeah. Um, but the whole time I'm like shaking because like, oh, this is the guy that wrote so many things. Like, what is my life right now? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I, I get that for sure. Yeah, and uh, I, same thing. I got real into metal for like maybe a year or two at the end of high school, and then I kind of never went back to it. I can still listen to it and appreciate it for what it is, but it's just like, it's not my choice anymore. I don't get the people who just are like all metal all the time. Yeah. It's like the same with Nirvana, just like, except all metal kind of starts to sound the same after. There's a lot of yelling and a lot of anger. (laughs) There's a lot of anger. (laughs) I can respect it for what it is and the technical side of it. Yeah, because uh, like metal play or metal musicians are some of the most like technically precise. Oh, they're they're unbelievable. Yeah. It's incredible what what um, there's there's actually this local this local band here who, God, I love and hate them so much. Um, <laughs> but I use Fuckboy okay. as a great example of a terrible band full of amazing musicians. <laughs> like they're such a technically precise and perfect band. That makes garbage fucking music. <laughs> and like, I love all the guys in that band. Like, they know this. Like, it's really good by being shitty. Yeah. So, I guess they're a bit though, so. Nah. <laughs> yeah, but like, that's when, after I got through my metal phase is when I kind of came into my own, like, that's when I really started actually getting into music, you yeah. know? And that's when I started exploring like just all music, and that's when like music kind of became a really big thing to me. And that wasn't until actually after high school when I was into like my 18, 19. I think I was probably about because I, I worked at a country station. It was my first job ever at um, uh, Fort McMurray's Country, Country <laughs> 93 C J O C. Uh, I had this like a little country phase for a while. Yeah. Um, it was right before country went like. Super, super. Oh yeah, we're in an arena singing about trucks. In <laughs> a truck time, like it's before when that zone. Um, and you had like this kind of fading out of like very storytelling focused country. Yeah. And so like I got in that really well. Like after after that is when I the yeah, same cool thing. I think I was about twenty ish, where I found my zone both in like generally as a music fan yeah. and especially on like the Canadian music scene because yeah. I think the first pop record came out then yeah. and that was like a nice oh hey this is some of this like kind of angrier stuff that I like but it's not just noise yeah. um, which pop still does 
and I don't know if you listen to their new album, Morbid Stuff. Oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> like the first lyric of the first song was like, I was bored as fuck sitting around thinking uh, all these all this morbid stuff and I was like hi my depression's screaming at the at this album right now yeah and it's uh, while still being like a little angry and guitar driven yeah yeah which is dope yeah that was uh, I think the first like record that really did that for me was uh, Kazaya by Protest the Hero oh man there's so many good Protest the Hero records yeah, too though yeah yeah but Kazaya was the first one that I listened to and like it was still like very melodic and very technical, but it was like angry and heavy, which yeah. like, I very much appreciated. But yeah. it was still like very pretty in its own way, you know? Like with some of the vocals and some of the lyrics, and I was like, this is insane. It was like everything that I liked about music all just like thrown into one. Well, see, and I hit that with the Gaslight Anthem. Okay. Um, which was another band I discovered through Rise Against. Yeah. Because they, they toured together. And I think it was right before Handwritten came out. Which I want to say was like, oh god. I'm sure I could look it up, but I think Handwritten came out in like 2013. And that was their, that was already their fourth record. Yeah. Or third record? Fourth record? Fourth record. One of them. Yeah. And that was like, I was seeing them open up for, Ga for Gaslight open up for Rise Against, and I was like, whoa, whoa, okay, there's a lot of my feelings being sung right now, and I don't know how to process this. Yeah. Yeah, in, in like a really kind of great and empowering way. And then that shot me back into listening to like old Gaslight stuff. Um, and then seeing Gaslight tour with Frank Turner, and you know, seeing Frank Turner for the first time was a life altering moment. Uh, and getting into like that more kind of English punk zone. And, yeah, and then I've, and that, now all of my bands have been somehow connected back to either Gaslight and like they've toured together or recorded together so I got into like Chuck Reagan and then I, f I forgot that he was in Hot Water Music and so I had like another Hot Water Music phase again and then into like even guys like like, uh, like Northcote from, from Victoria who has toured with Hot Water Music and Chuck Reagan who have toured with Frank and Gaslight and Dave House, like all this stuff that all, they're all, all my favorite bands are also friends in real life, yeah. which I've learned like in radio, which makes me really happy. And so, yeah, like it's crazy, like what bands, it's like a, um, uh, it's like a, the Cerebro from, from X-Men, like yeah. that when Patrick Stewart first puts on the helmet, I used those lines shoot from person to person to person yeah. to connect everyone in this world that he can nerf with his mind because yeah. he's a you know a class five mutant. That's what it is with music for me anyway. Yeah. That was a really long riff for very little payoff. But I'm very sorry. That's fine. <laughs> That's what podcasts are, man. <laughs> But yeah, that's like, it's like the, it's the same, the, like, when I was getting into music too, it'd be like, you'd go to a show, and you'd be going to see somebody, and then... The opener. The opener. I get so mad yeah. at people that don't go see the opener. Yeah. Like, I, I, I always, like, I know I get it, like, I mean, this, is a, this is more of a music industry problem as a whole. Mm. Um, you got, you got, especially for local shows, yeah. stop putting your opener at 1230. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I will, I put a lot of love for, for one venue in town for this one. And I mean, they don't do it out of like care for people that would have day jobs. They do it because they flip their venue over into a dance club. Yeah. And so it'll go from like hipsters going to see whomever to, to like, okay, that girl's having her 19th birthday and she's just like so ready to dance. <laughs> Uh, but that's Commonwealth. Okay. Uh, it was a great room. The acoustics are awesome. The staff's really sweet and chill. Um, but there, if it's a rock show, or like an alt show that like we that acts are presenting, they go on at eight, maybe eight thirty at the latest, awesome. and are done by ten. That's amazing. <laughs> like, and if you want, honestly, if you want to get more bands, like people to come out to your openers, yeah. you know, God love Dickens. I'm not going to a show if the band I want to see isn't going on until 1.30. Like, you can't even order Domino's after that point. Fuck off. It's, I'm tired and hungry and Especially, fat. Like, leave me alone. Especially if this show is on a... Uh, between Monday and Thursday. Yeah. Oh, I've been to a lot of... Like, a lot of God Love Dickens. Even... Although, I guess Burns doesn't really open during the week, so it doesn't matter. But, like... Yeah. But, yeah, no. Like, honestly, I've, we've, I've talked about it before. Like... 
why is it that the first band is going on at 10 o'clock at night? Like, that is... Makes zero sense to me. Maybe it's just the aging uh, person inside <laughs> of me. <laughs> you know, God damn it, we should be really good if I can see my bands with the guitars at 4.30, I can stop for a tapioca at 6 and be home by 8 to watch my stories. 100% though, I want to be at home by 8 to watch my stories <laughs> exactly. because my favorite D&D show starts at 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. Pacific. I want to be there for it. Fuck off. <laughs> exactly. Like, even on a weekend, like, I don't want to be out until 2 in the morning to see my favorite band. I, the latest the main action come on is like midnight and then like if you want if people want to party after that then do something else put on a dj or something i don't know but well like, this is something I, I, i've been trying to spend a little bit more time in the states lately um yeah i was just mentioned earlier just in seattle i went to a show there and they had they had like a a opener style act at, i want to say they went on at one and I was like, this is perfect. Like, you have your main man done. Everyone that wants to go home can go home. You can serve liquor for another two hours in Washington State. Yeah. And this band can get some stage time. Or, yeah, it's like they have a stand-up comedy. Like, you have your headliner going on at 9, doing a 45-minute, 90-minute set, and then let people drink and then throw on your extras, right? So... I would love that. Give your that would I would that requires a full sale change in the music industry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah, I'm sure like as I'm saying this, I see why like maybe a bar would throw their act on at one o'clock. It can keep people um, drinking for keep, two hours. Exactly. Or an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It keeps people being like, Well, I wanna see the person I came to see, so I'm going to be here for the entire time. Like, yeah, well and, and you know I'm not just hang out and not have a beer. Yeah, right? exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, it sucks. You know, in the end, it all comes down to goddamn capitalism. <laughs> you jerk. Curse you, free market garbage. Um, so one of the things that I actually noticed a lot about your show, and one of the reasons why I actually wanted to ask you onto this podcast is because, um, like, in between the songs, you do, like, a lot of research, it seems, on the bands that you're playing. And you always give, like, little tidbits of information, like, uh, oh, this person released this record because of this or whatever. Like, this is what this band says about this song or something like that. So what made you start doing that? Like, um, Ooh, that's a good question. So I just love, I first out love music. Obviously, yeah. I uh, <laughs> hope that's really clear by now. Um, but for, for me... Um, why do you listen to the radio? If when you do listen to radio, or why do you listen? To radio, what are you listening for? Music. There we go. That's why. Yeah. Um, and I had a when I was a board op. Um, so that's like a person that comes on and presses the buttons and like makes sure things air properly. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing this sheet that was put in the studio. Uh, the station I was at in Edmonton. So I would do street team stuff for Sonic, which is like the cool alt station. And then when I was there, uh, the parent company, Rogers, bought this station called The Bounce, which is like top 40, top, top, hot, hot AC stuff, and which was not my music. But he, there was a sheet that the program director, a guy named Al Ford, who still runs Sonic 1029, yeah. um, put in the studio. And it was just this kind of ranking of what we talk about and what is important to our brand. And the, the first thing that came up was music we play and the second thing that came up was our city so that was something that was really kind of stuck with me for a long time um i love i'm really lucky to work in alternative radio uh and i've been lucky to work in alternative for most of for more than half my career now um because it's what i listen to when i go home so it helps age like i like reading about the bands um i've been really lucky to get to know a lot of the musicians we play and Frankly, it's really nice if I don't know something, I can, you know, text someone who knows in the band, which is really lucky for me. It's a thing I've, I've been really been able to build a lot of good relations with people, especially in the Canadian music scene. Um, but yeah, it's like I like I like the music. I like what we play. I want I want to learn about it. Yeah. And if I've learned one thing about my about broadcasting the things that people most connect with because in the end of the day my job is to keep you listening for as long as possible yeah like that's my that is that is my role yeah um whether that's doing it through comedy or 
the city or like myself or the music, doesn't matter. Everyone has, the, every announcer has their own different way of doing it. And my boss, Christian Hall, is very much like, do stuff. Just try whatever you want to do and just see how it goes. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's it's being excited about the music we play and selling the fact that that this stuff is fucking rad. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's cool to get a new song that, like the one we just started playing now, the song itself is two years old, but Matt Mason's track, Cringe. Um, that song is amazing and it has, it has so much kind of raw emotion to it. Uh, well, being a very beautiful melodic song, I love getting into that. So, for me, what I want my show to be is, um, I, I want it, I won't get excited about what I'm doing unless I actually really like it. So I just talk about things I like. Yeah. And music being one of them. Yeah. So, it's it's funny, I think I'm, I'm I probably have, at X right now, the most music-based show. Um, because we're really lucky. We're just allowed to like talk and do whatever we want. Like I have a lot of weird stuff on my show from time to time that are either just like weird produced bits or just I don't know, for lack of a better word, me fucking around. Yeah. Um, but when I came to X four years ago, my boss Christian Hall, who's a um, just a he's, he's an incredible. I'm so lucky to have him as a boss. I'm not just saying that because he signed my paycheck, but he's taught me so much about the the, the industry of broadcast. Yeah. And. He's like, when I came to X, he's like, all right, this is what your show is. Your show is made up of this plate of, of all these different ingredients that make the whole meal that is that is the Graham Moseman program. And right now, there's a lot of music here. My whole show is pretty much music focused. It was a very um, Alan Cross inspired type of thing. Okay. And because that's what I've been doing for so long, and that's what I'm what I was really good at. And yeah. so it was when I came to X, he was like, hey, this is an ingredient. Let's not let this mashed potatoes overflow everything else. Let's like scrape that back and try every and put other things in here. Whether that's like really nerdy stuff, like like D and D, or, or like I talk about video games a lot on my show, <laughs> um, or like even some more sportsy stuff or yeah. or, or Calgary stuff. Because uh, because I mean anyone can listen to anyone can listen to Spotify. Anyone can find the songs they want in a better, easier way. I need to be, I need to, my job is to give them something that they cannot get on Spotify. Yeah. Um, or, or have, you know, you know, FM broadcast be convenient enough and free. You know, you don't get a data charge for, for listening to X for too long um, if you're over terrestrial radio. So it's, you know, unless, you're not going to find what I hope is something um, that you can just read off Wikipedia. Yeah. Because um, I like to put in the time, I like to put in the research, and I like to ask questions yeah. of people. So that's a very long ramble of having a TLDR. I like it. <laughs> I talk about it because I like it. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool, though. Like, that's like, again, that's why it's like why I started this podcast, you know, is because I was just curious about music. And I knew a lot of people in my life who was who were doing music. Yeah. Um, so when I first started a podcast, I just wanted to. The first idea I had was to just do a travel podcast. Yeah. Because I was kind of working for my friends as like a travel writer, or like I was just handing them pieces and stuff. And I was like, oh, maybe I could do a podcast, and that would be like cooler, you know? You can, but yeah, tie everything in. Yeah. Tie it in. That lasted like three episodes <laughs> I was like I don't know that many people who have traveled places and then I was like oh but I know a lot of people who are in the music scene yeah so then I started doing this podcast which is a music podcast and of, like of, well, yeah of all the of all the industries like I've, I've lucky enough to spend time into the ones I am most attracted to are the ones that are filled with passion and I don't want to generalize not I'm not saying your aunt Becky isn't really passionate about <laughs> about her job at H&R Block yeah. I just don't give a shit because yeah. um, it's a job and, and and I find the people I'm most attracted to yeah. and that I want to spend time around are people that have things that they really love and care about yeah um if you're if your life is based down to you know like I'll use my dad as an example um dad my dad has his job driving truck because it allows him to spend time with his kids, with his partner, and allows him to go camping a lot. Yeah. Those are his things. Like, those are, that's his purpose. My purpose, you know, would, is, is to 
like tie everything together. I don't I don't want to work. I don't want to work for money to get the thing I want. I want everything to be the thing I want. Yeah. I feel like it's a very millennial thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, whether that's like D&D or music or travel. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just more fun. And people in music are generally pretty fucking cool. That's the thing too. <laughs> it's like just talking to passionate people, and no matter what they're passionate about, like whether if they're truly passionate about it, it's interesting. You yeah, and you mean? can't fake it. And you that's exactly. and that's that's one thing I really have learned through broadcasting and try to put through my show. Um, I want even if it's something a, you know a little more niche, like you know like Dungeons and Dragons, or tabletop role play, or even comic books. You know, as non niche as those things are becoming, you know, there's still there's still there's still a more narrow audience than some than some other things. Yeah. Um, I believe, and I think this has served me well through my career. If I do something with excitement, it's hard not to get excited about whatever it is. Like you hear something that someone's super jacked about, you just see their body language changes. They change, and it's hard not to get fucking jazzed about it because they're excited about it. Yeah. yeah. So. If I can tie that into the world of broadcasting, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I know, I know. It's it's a it's a cool world to be in if you care about something. Yeah, definitely. And like, like even to all my friends right now, like if they're maybe going through like a little bit of a slump or something, I like my advice to them. Like it's always the same. It's like. Find something that you really, really care about, yeah. that you want to see yourself get better at, and invest your time into it. Yeah. Whether it be drawing, whether it be D&D, whether it be dancing, like whatever it is, just find something that you can see growth in, and that you're really passionate about, and invest your time in. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, well that's, that's one of the things that, you know, to go back to D&D for a sec, um, I'm really lucky that I kind of rediscovered, because uh, I got that, that fun combo of of, of, of uh, <laughs> chronic depression and anxiety disorder. Mm. So I, I call it the snowball, mm. where you'll, like you'll be good, you doing good for a while, like things are okay, but then like one little thing starts to go wrong, and especially if you have, you know, if, if you uh, make it tend to have like more of a mental health struggle, as everyone, almost everyone has, yeah. uh, or, or dealt with in different levels of severity. You know, that little snowball, that one little negative thing turns into another negative thing that just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And then, at least for me, I'm spending a week inside my apartment, you know, sad, playing shitty video games and, and having no real, you know, value to stuff. And having found something like Dungeons & Dragons, thank you, no um, has that forces you to be communal and, you know, lets me tie into things other things that I've got into like acting or whatever or even you know stupid voices um, even though all my fucking dwarves turn out to be Australian for some reason <laughs> all my dwarves turn out to be Scottish so <laughs> I, see, I, I try and I can't do it and they all I all end up being some variation of Australian for whatever reason <laughs> but then the character I play is like vaguely French Russian maybe Georgia like slightly getting into what kind of Middle Eastern world no idea. Yeah. It was a smorgasbord of disaster. Yeah. My my aggressively confused bisexual hexblade warlock. <laughs> um, God damn, I love that man. <laughs> but yeah, like finding yeah finding that kind of passion was was yeah it was it was huge and I and I have that's why I have D20s and beholders and shit tattooed. Like I I, just, I love that game so much. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same reason that I got uh, a D20 tattooed onto myself is like I the back piece that I have is just all things that I'm passionate about and the things that bring me joy. So there's yeah. a little piece that kind of ties that in. So what what else is in there? Because I'm like obviously don't take your shirt off. Yeah. At, at, at the pub. <laughs> so uh, there's a book for reading and then there's a quill for writing. Yeah. Um, and then there's like a baton for conducting music that represents music as there's like music notes coming off of it. Oh, that's dope. And then there's a D20 and there's like this little potion pot thing which is supposed to represent plants and gardening. Yeah. So oh, that's so are, rad. At the time that I got the tattoo, those were all the things that I was like very, very passionate about. And yeah. Those are the things that made me happy. So. Well, man, like I mean, I got my, my old tattoos are super, like pretty, pretty nerdy for the most part. Like, yeah. I got feathers on my one arm. I'm supposed to have one feather for every radio station I ever worked at. I kind of got forgotten about, so I have a couple of stations behind. Uh, but I used to be in theater, and the last play I was in before I gave up theater to go to radio had a lot of feather symbolism on that one. So yeah. that's those ones. 
And then after that, I was just like, I like things that are cool. Yeah. So I got like, this is a bit from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on it. Like, it's a D20, it's a Beholder. I got the boss of the Shadow Temple from Ocarina of Time on my thigh. <laughs> Dope. Oh my god, it looks so like, I'm, <laughs> the first time, like the, the first time I, I had kind of spent real time with my now, my now um, common law partner, like I, I think I came out of the washroom and I was just like wearing like underwear or whatever. She was like, what the fuck is on your leg? <laughs> and I was like, wait, what are you, is there something on my leg? She's like, no, that tattoo, what the hell is that? And I was like, do you not know it? Like this, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a monster from a video game that came out in 1998. Uh, what's your problem? I don't understand. Still one of the greatest video games that was ever made, I think. Yes, so. absolutely. <laughs> no question. <laughs> like, that game was revolutionary. <laughs> like, well, because it was, it was, the Orphan of Time was, you know, as we're looking at it in the music lens, all the music, even in its like kind of 64 bit, um, you know, kind of glory, was I can hear the music of the Shadow Temple, you know, in my head. Like yeah. the. Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da. <laughs> I'm just getting happy thinking about the forest music. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, the temple, like the music in that game was so, so incredible. Yeah. And honestly, I don't know if there's been a game that's kind of matched that. I mean, as we look at it through the lens of nostalgia, um, as well as maybe like Journey. You ever yeah. played Journey from a few years ago? Beautiful, still amazing. Yeah. Um, or even like uh, Red Dead Redemption. The music in that game was was incredible. Yeah. Um, they continue that on in you know RDR two. Like the mu the music feels like its own character in the games. Yeah. Which is which is cool. Yeah. Last of Us didn't really do that, but it was more atmospheric. Even just the fact that they somehow tied music into the actual gameplay of Ocarina of Time, like you had an Ocarina. You played music it's in, yeah, it's, to summon things or transport to places. <laughs> I, I distinctly remember being in high school band with my with my alto saxophone and jazz band, and one of my warm-ups was, was I had noodled out how to do the Bolero of Fire. Yeah. And that was one of my warm-ups when I was playing once. We were at a music festival, because I was a high school band nerd. Um, we were at a music festival in Sun Peaks outside of uh, Kamloops. And I started like playing that before my warm up, and some guy from like, I don't know, Vancouver Secondary Musical Theater Academy, like ran over and just gave me a hug, because uh, it's such an amazing connective bond. Yeah. Uh, which is which is super fun. Like, there's so much power in music. Yeah. Oh, uh, definitely. And it's it's not even just music. It's just again, I think it goes back to anything that you're passionate about, like yeah. whether it be video games or. Uh, comic books or anime or when you find somebody else who is also passionate about those things you're just you're, you become friends you, you have, have a connected point forever you're as friends, friends instantly <laughs> and you just nerd out about that thing well, as we've done for like 40 minutes <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> like I walked into the bar we had like our formalities and like the conversation hasn't stopped even as I was setting up the microphone you were still talking like I was like kind of cool people man it's helpful <laughs> yeah it's exactly. alright <laughs> oh man like and so you just like that's the thing about like again having passions too is it just it draws you and it helps you find that community you know and having a community I think is really something that a lot of people lack in their everyday lives yep. in today's society so well like, especially you know you can even like you have the ubiquitousness of the internet yeah. with, um, it's, it's the great unifier and the great isolator all at once um, like I've been really lucky to found, found a, uh, a couple different communities online that have been really cool I recently started going to a kind of a group therapy sort of thing and I've never done group therapy before. I've been in therapy for um, for four years. I've never done group therapy before, but having found it in the past like two and a half months or so, it's amazing how much it can kind of change your sort of outlook to like look at a thing on a calendar and be like, that's jam. For when I'm gonna go hang out with my band buds, like this is where I'm gonna go to my group therapy. This is where I'm going to play D and D. Um, to to kind of make a well-rounded person. Yeah. Uh, which is which is super fucking cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that uh, today, more than any other time, we kind of understand what it means to be a more well-rounded person. You know what I mean? It's yeah, totally. Like back in the day, it used to be like 
It was you work to your die. Yeah, you exactly. Were, you and, were, that, and that was admirable, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, oh, I don't take sick days because I'm a good worker. And you're like, but now I think it's more acceptable to be like, you know what, I'm just having a bad day. Like, I'm off. I may need a day off. And people are more accepting of that. Yeah, you know? well, I, I kept myself really lucky. I mean, I, I took a... Um, it was it was when I got booted from my D&D campaign once. And that was still, like, the one of the worst experiences I've had in my life. Um because I was a shitty player. I was not fun to be around. I was in a negative brain space. I was taking it out accidentally on my friends through the game. And I was asked to leave. Yeah. And I took a, I had to take a mental health day off work because I, I got up the next morning, I was like, I can't, there's no way I can be functional and entertaining right now. This will not work. Yeah. And I went in, I talked to my boss, he's like, are you okay? I was like, no, I'm not. He's like, do you need a day? I was like, yes. And, and it wasn't even a question. He's like, cool, fill out a sick form. I was like, do I need a doctor's note? He's like, how do I give you a doctor's note for a mental health day? It's a sick day. Move on. Yeah. And I was like, that was amazing. And I'm, I count myself really lucky to work at X99 for stuff like that. Even I've recently gone through some like a lot more intense mental health stuff. And it was, Kate, take some time away. Figure yourself out. Now, how can we help you as an employee yeah. to be better? Yeah. And... You know, a lot of radio stations don't have that. And so I will count myself and wherever I may work moving forward, that will be a, a key thing that I hope to look for. And if I'm ever in a hiring role, I hope that that's something that, you know, I can bring. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's just like, that's becoming more and more common, like that kind of thing. Like I work for a similar type of company, like... Um, they're just very understanding when like, hey, if something's going wrong, if you need time, like that's yeah. cool, like you take it. But yeah, I think that's becoming more and more of a thing. It's like, especially in smaller companies or people who... Oh yeah, my company is a dozen, a baker's dozen radio station. Yeah. We have 13. Like yeah. we are minuscule on the media landscape, but yeah. you know, we've been able to do some really cool stuff yeah. um, just in broadcast specifically. And like, honestly, like... My company is the same. It's I think there's maybe ten employees there, you know. So it, it just makes it so that like I feel like a you're more responsible because if you fuck up, then like you're dragging all these other people down. You can see the direct results of your yeah. fuck ups, so it makes you be more accountable and stuff like 100%. that. But it also allows your employers to like get to know you and be like, hey, you are having an off day. Like, yeah. do you need that time off? Like, because take it. Like, I want you to be. At your best, you yeah. Know? You're, like, you're you 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 having a day off and losing a day of productivity is not nearly as bad as you losing you know forty percent of your productivity over a week if yeah. you want to really break down the numbers. Yeah. And you know that's that's the great that's like one of the great unifiers of music. And you know I'm, I'm really lucky. It gets me to a lot of touring bands. Like yeah. honestly, I don't know how they do it a lot of the time. Um, we we had Portugal the Man come into work about a year ago. Yeah. And like you want to talk about a group of guys that had that had their whole world change overnight. Like that was that band. Yeah. Cause they went from being like indie darlings to having like a pretty, like a pretty good following. Like I remember we announced a show with them and KG Elephant like two years ago. And I can, I will comfortably say there were more people being like, Portugal the man's coming to Calgary. So I have to go. Cause they were, you know, five records in at that point made some really cool stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, their Woodstock album came out and then Feel It Still became a hit. And then they went from like, okay, yeah, let's see how this tour goes. Am I, or am I gonna have rent money when I come back? Yeah. Um, to, oh, oh, we want a Grammy? <laughs> cool, yeah. we want a Grammy. But like they've, you know, had so many years of them as a band being like just grinding it out. Yeah. That when that fame hit, it was like, well, this is cool, I guess. But but they've already had the preset base of personality of not having that like they're they're fully grown and developed people and know who they are yes. like fame isn't going to change that yeah um and you see you built they built that community among their band you know even from going from like grinding it out to you know figure out like they're I'll keep focusing on them uh but they even how they write music and how they split up royalties is really is really interesting because you know a lot of bands will do like nope everyone's even call it that way. Portugal doesn't. Yeah. It's, okay, I made this riff. This is this percentage of the song. I made this, this percentage of the song. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. But we share touring revenue. Okay. So, yeah, that's the one thing that kind of sucks about music on that level is you have to break things down because you are ultimately an incorporated business as yeah. 
you know, Schlerpity Burp band from Calgary. Yeah. Um, but you still have to have that kind of community, otherwise the band's going to go nowhere. Yeah. And I think that's, like, good advice for any band that is just starting out, but I think that's a lot of things are... The one thing that a lot of bands seem to miss is that if you do want to make it as a band... You've got to be a... Oh, my God. You have, have to treat it as a business. You have to. No question. I mean, there's been some really good bands in Calgary. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not going to name names, but, like, you've, I've seen them come through the station. I've seen them play a lot of shows and, you know, treat it as you know fuck around time yeah. and then like not having not having even a band bank account yeah. if you're gonna do the thing of trying to make money at it get a bank account make sure one of you is the manager of the money split things down and you have to you have to set it up in such a way that you know if you do get that record contract um that there's already preset things in place for you guys to do stuff I mean otherwise you're just self-publishing, you know, and, and hoping to make back your money and, hey, maybe we can afford a vinyl pressing this time. <laughs> yeah. And, hey, if that's what you want to do, if that's if it's oh, your no, hobby... Oh, no, no knock on that. Yeah, no, no. No I knock agree, on that at all. If, that, if it's your hobby and that's a thing that it's your hobby and that's all you're doing it for, then cool. But if you want to take it seriously, if you want to make it and if you want to make music your thing, yeah. you got to treat it like a business. Yeah. Like, well, like, it's funny. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll name a name. Like, like Sean Hamilton's really good at that yeah. in, like, the Calgary music scene. He's really... Like, super fun, chill, rad party dude, but, like, he also knows, like, where the business line is. Yeah. And, you know, Sean's he's good at that shit. Yeah. So, it's, uh... Yeah, now we're getting really deep in the Calgary music reports. <laughs> That's um, what this podcast is about, so... <laughs> but, yeah, there's... You gotta have some kind of plan to it. Like, even just making a band bank account and figure out who can access it and yeah. for what. Yeah. It's pretty key. Yeah. And, I mean, like, I've talked to many different bands in the Calgary music scene now. This is episode... 75 or 76. Which is so. awesome, by the way. I felt bad, like, because when you sent me the note, like, to come on, I was like, sure, I'd love to. And then I went back to listen to your catalog. I was like, shit, this is really cool. There's a lot of fucking rad people in this. I'm on board. Yeah, so I've talked to a lot of bands, and I've seen all the different kinds. I've seen the bands that have come in, and, like, you can tell they don't really know what they're... They're just like, this yeah. is fun, whatever. And then you you can tell when a band is like, I'm taking this seriously. This yeah. is something I want to do. Like, yeah. They're just more serious and more professional about it. They come with, like, hey, this is our CD. Here, take a listen. Blah, blah, blah. Stuff yeah. like that. I did not bring you one of my air checks. <laughs> Even if I did, they're not good. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's just, like, yeah, if you want to make, unfortunately, as much as you may think it takes away from the music or whatever, if you want to make it in the business, you have to treat it like a business. Well, and if you want to get to the point where, you know, you are dealing with a label contract, like, you know, they'll force you to do it. Like, yeah. certain certain labels will not deal with you unless you have a business plan. Yeah. Or if they really believe they'll make you have a business plan. Yeah. Um, and yeah, sure, it does take, like, man, it takes some of the punk rock out of it. <laughs> but, you know, put all that shit aside, you want to like be the punk rock parts about it? Put that shit on stage. Put that. No matter what you are doing, especially because your odds are probably not going to make a ton of revenue from your Spotify streams or or your SoundCloud oh, downloads. Oh, I have a bad pull. Um, you know, you make your money on the stage. Actually, that's you know one thing that's kind of both been really negative, really bad, been really positive for the music industry as a whole. At least in my years of of, of being you know kind of tangentially in it. Um, God, the quality of the live show has gone through the fucking roof. I agree. Like, because people have figured out, like, you want to get people to come back. Um, I'll use Pop as an example again. Just to really, I really love that band. They're so good. Um, and the first time they played in Calgary, I'm pretty sure they played at the Legion. Like, the number one Legion downtown. Not that's bad, but, like, that's a great starting venue. And then after that, like, their last show here, they were playing at, uh, they were at the, the Gateway. Um, with with Craig and Jessica running that room and running the band side and like they've had a great show there and then now they're at McEwen Hall and just every time they go out they like get that crazy live show they build up the fan base they come back again and again and again mm. and you know there's still just a bunch of fucking 20 somethings that live in Toronto and make angry music it's great yeah <laughs> uh, so like yeah that's what you you have to make your your monies and your your livelihood will come from touring yeah. which on one hand blows like going away from your whole family and your whole life for like six months or so out of a time and then hoping you have enough to cover rent when you get back is a scary world. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I'll use like Modern Space is a really good example of something they did really well. Like they did not have a ton of money. I don't think they quite had signed with Warner yet, but they had a couple songs. And so they just, they did the GTA circuit every week. Like they found a different room and played again and again and again and again and again, and again and, and until they got that Warner deal. And you know, the first time they came to X was the first time I think they'd been out of province. I might be wrong on that one, but like it was definitely the first time in Alberta. I think it was their first kind of cross Canada tour, and they were like, "This is this is cool." Yeah, I've never been out here because they just did that GTA circuit like, yeah. as many times as they could. Yeah, you get Vancouver and Toronto that has more of a natural kind of luck with that because you just play. Yeah, and you know we have to, you know, travel an hour and a half just to hopefully hopefully get a set at Bose. Yeah. You know, if that's the circuit you're kind of going for, yeah. in Red Deer. So. Yeah, exactly. It's unfortunate, uh, but it's, yeah, it's a, the reality that Canadian bands do have to face is that it's a, our country's just a lot more spread out. Like. Well, and that's like, <laughs> you know, I, 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 had, uh, I had an American band ask me once, like, why are all the bands from Vancouver or Toronto? Why is there no one from here? I was like, well, you can't tour. Like, your costs are, are, are tenfold. Because you have to get, that's an extra hotel day, that's an extra van rental day, that's another day you got to pay the crew. Like, it's 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 hard. Yeah. Like, one of the only bands that's doing really well right now, I think, is Royal Foundry um, from, from Edmonton. And I am, I am, if this next record goes well, it comes out in October, like, if that record goes well, like, they got to move. Because they are not going to get the same touring experience at the level they want to if they're sinking you know, a tenth of their, like a, a tenth of their budget, not a tenth of their budget, like a, like a nine tenths of their budget into traveling from Edmonton. Yeah. Which sucks, because like Edmonton's a great music town. So is Winnipeg for that matter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of bands, it sucks that you gotta leave because you gotta get close, so. Yeah. Unless, unless you're really stoked to tour Missoula, <laughs> Montana, which is still 10 hours away. <laughs> but I think. You gotta move, guys. <laughs> I think that that, because of that, it has made Calgary, kind of a very unique music. Calgary, scene. Edmonton, and Winnipeg both have amazing. I wish I could say more about Saskatoon, Regina. I don't know as much. Yeah. The local scenes here are so tight knit, oh, yeah. and they're so, they can be so supportive. Like you occasionally get like some shitty band drama, which just sucks. But you have you have creative people together who tend to booze. Yeah. <laughs> like weird <laughs> shit happens. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, our local scenes are amazing, and and you know Winnipeg really wins out on this one. Um, especially, especially if you like a heavy scene, dude. Winnipeg has a good heavy, heavy scene because it's cold and you're angry all the time. <laughs> that makes sense. But, and you can't travel because, like, what's the next biggest city? Ooh, six hours to Regina. Ooh. Guess we're gonna go play Victoria Tavern again. <laughs> I spent, oh my God, for that doesn't drink it anymore. I spent a lot of time in bars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, what's maybe something that people maybe wouldn't expect about radio that you know? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, um, ooh, uh, like maybe a misconception about radio. I'll go. I'll do a. I'll do a negative one first, then I'll do a positive one. Okay. Um, it's not a problem at X. Um, but I have worked a lot of stations where substance abuse is a real problem. And that's not something I was ever warned about. Like, it was kind of like, hey, you go drinking a lot. Like, ooh -hoo, have fun. You go to a lot of bar remotes. Uh, it's nothing really prepares you for how bad it can be. And, and when I lived in Winnipeg, you know, I, I picked up a real good little cocaine habit for a while. And... You know, I got into some other heavier stuff because, like, you just you end up in a certain crowd of people, and you—it's just around. And you know, I—I I, I mentioned like I'm casually not drinking anymore. Like, I'm—I'm—I am comfortable saying I'm an alcoholic. Mm. Like, I can't drink because I drink too much if I do. Yeah. Um, and so that's just a thing. I can't go down that road anymore. And, and uh, what is kind of really cool about it is that we're sitting in a brewery right now, and it's like, okay, cool. I'm like a soda water and a virgin Caesar. I'm having a great time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it is really easy to kind of get into a pattern of doing stuff like that all the time and having it really, uh, having it really hurt your life. Whether it's booze, whether it's drugs, whatever. Um, that's a negative. 
um, the positive, holy shit, the people are so cool. And not just the on-air <laughs> staff. Like, all the, all the team at X, I love each and every one of them. I, they would, would invite them to my wedding. Like, we would, we would, we were, it's just, it's not a normal co-worker relationship. But even, like, people on the sales side, promotions, even, you have, like, a traffic department, that's, that, that's not, like, well, oh, there's a collision on, there's a collision on the door for it, avoid it. It's, it's the, it's called traffic, because it's, it's radio traffic of scheduling commercials. Okay. And scheduling stuff like that. Like, everyone is so cool, and, and, like, fun, and interesting, and outgoing, and, and you have this wonderful mix of people. Every radio station I've worked at, I've found someone I've been like, you're amazing and I love you and I want to spend time with you. Because you're just a cool, not the guy that just walked by, but I'm sure you're lovely, <laughs> uh, but like people at my work. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I have a really great friend from every single radio station I've ever worked with. Yeah. And I don't know a lot of jobs that are in that same way. I am, I am fully confident, not even just in, not even, you know, people I work with, but like people in the industry are just awesome. I have, I know for a fact, like I was talking to my, I was talking to my partner the other day and we were talking about like different cities and stuff around town. I was like, oh yeah, I know a guy there. He's like, oh, how do you know? I was like, I don't know, we met like once at an event when I was like driving through town. And he was like, how are you guys friends? He's like, I don't know, we just talk all the time. So like I I'm I there's not a major Canadian city with the exception of maybe like Montreal yeah. where I don't think I know at least someone through in the industry because it's so small and everyone just gets along so well. Yeah. Um, like that's really cool. Like I can I can drive I could have a couch to stay on and it pretty much from here to Halifax. Yeah. And many of the people I don't know if I've met before. Um, but we've talked so much online. Like I've had people that I've never met before come stay in my house because hey, you're in radio. Like you, we get a, like we must get along, and we invariably do. Um, so yeah, it's a tiny industry. It's kind of a joke. Like ah, hey, you you know everybody. It's you, yeah, it's, you you kind of do. Um, and I don't know if this is true anymore, but I've heard like the cliche is like oh, I'm sorry, I I listen to the other station. You must hate that. I don't give a shit. Like I get paid anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of cool people that work at you know at CJ in Calgary's case, or you know the Rogers. Like there's there's so many rad people that work at Sportsnet 960. Yeah. Um, that's not our company. Like we don't. Yeah, it's not like the old Flames versus Oilers battle where you're like we're gonna punch your face in because we're fighting and like yeah we're competitive and we want to win like you're in this industry to be to 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 be better than someone else we all get along like we're pretty everyone's pretty much friends so that's super fucking cool and that makes up for some of the darker stuff <laughs> um, so I guess where do you where do you see the future of radio going? Um, I see it being a uh, a focus being put on personality okay. over uh, over other things, um, uh, and and the and and cool experiences, personality and experience over anything else. Because the the excitement of like winning five hundred bucks, I think, is negligible now. Like money's cool, everyone likes money. Do you know what's way better than saying, ah, I want 500 bucks from X99 to put on my credit card? It's, you know, oh my God, I want a trip to Montreal to go see Portugal the man. Like, what? That was awesome. So yeah. I think that as an industry is going to change to be more of an experience-based, kind of from a purely pricing perspective. Um, and then, yeah, like you, you, it will be very, very personality heavy because there's so much other things you can do and so many other ways to connect with people um, or find the thing you want. What's going to set us apart is the personality. Um, so that'll, I think that'll be a big one. I am, I am, I can't, Harvard Broadcasting as a company is one that's really pushing on that one, not just because it's not my paychecks, but because I've seen it happen. Like I've, I've interviewed with other radio stations. I've been like, can I be myself? Can I do these things? Can I play Dungeons and Dragons on the radio? Like, no, 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 too niche, whatever. Just like talk to the records. It's like, yeah. well, then you're already handicapping yourself as a broadcaster. Yeah. Um, because if all of my, and this is really common in American radio, like I listened to a station in Seattle when I was just down there, I didn't hear a single content break. I didn't hear something interesting that gave me a sense of who the person I was that I was listening to. All I heard was, uh, yeah, we're, uh, it's the two minute promise. We're never gonna play more two minutes commercials. Win tickets to this, blah, 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 blah. Like there was, there was nothing to it. Yeah. Um, and it's boring. I don't, I think, 
you know, I use uh, our, our guy that does weekends uh, on our show, as our digital content producer at X, Andy Barrage. Um, he comes up with the weirdest shit I've ever heard. I don't understand <laughs> half of it. It is amazing, and I love it. Um, you're going to have a lot. Like, I, I think the era of being a morning show only driven station will and should be dead soon. Yeah. Because if you just have your mornings, you're sweet. Like, that's where you get your money, you get your advertising, you kind of build up from there. Um, but if you want to be profitable all in all as a station, you have to be strong across the board. So, yeah, radio will still change. Honestly, the delivery method might be different. I mean, uh, uh, Greenland is now, it's not, no, it's Iceland. Iceland is now no longer has terrestrial radio. Uh, they have digital radio. They have digital across the country. Okay. Um, you know, that's a little tougher to bring in Canada, but, you know, I see that. That's probably a thing. So I don't, I don't know if radio will ever go away. Yeah. Um, I think the profit margins will be different. So you're not gonna, you know, make your twenty million dollars um, because the profit lines aren't the same way there. Yeah. But, or you know, it'll segue to podcast as we're on podcast right now. Yeah. I have. So I don't really know. I know that it is an industry full of tremendously creative and interesting people, and interesting people. People want to listen to people who are interesting. Yeah. Radio has interesting people. Yeah. How that product gets to it, I have the people. I have no idea. Yeah. But I think it will, yeah. and it's and it's cool. And as long as I'm I'm lucky enough to apply my trade in this world or, or another, um, I'll count myself grateful for it because it's really cool. <laughs> it's really fun. Yeah. Like we met through this, and I've had so much fun today. This has been awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's a very again as as it has now become a thing. That was a rambly answer. But yeah, yeah, but like, honestly, rambly answers make my job very easy, so. <laughs> Yay, I am a blowhard, everything's great. <laughs> I hate it when like, I get, I'm interviewing somebody, or in, I, I don't like to even call these interviews. I, they're nice people hanging out. Yeah, they're yeah, conversations, yeah. but whenever I, when it feels like an interview, that's when you I You know when it sucks? Yeah. Oh my god, dude, I interviewed this guy. It wasn't at, it wasn't, it wasn't here. Uh, it was, it was, it was in Winnipeg, I think, and Jesus Christ, like you wanna, it was a new band too, and it was like you, you're, you're, especially Winni Winnipeg's weird, because Winnipeg is, loves their radio. Yeah. Like Winnipeg's a weird market outlier, like people listen, you are a bona fide celebrity <laughs> when you work in radio in Winnipeg. Um, and <laughs> this, this band that came in, and this guy was just fucking garbage. Like, <laughs> Yeah, how's your, how's, you know, how's the, how's the tour? Is your first big one outside of, you know, outside of Toronto? It's a lot of driving. <laughs> Seen anything cool? A lot of roads. You know how it is. Flat. It's like, fuck off, dude. Give me something. <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're not helping yourself. Yeah. You're not helping me at all here. Well, like, even like, that's why you, a whole of our council is a great example. Yeah. Um, that band created their own success. They did not just make good records, they did, but oh man, if they hit the pavement so hard to make a connection with every single person that they possibly could. And that's why they will, you know, wherever their career takes them, they will be up there with, you know, they will, they will be in that guess who hip, you know, maybe not Trooper, bad example, but like those kind of legendary icons of Canadianity yeah. when their career is done because they have, made an effort to meet every single Canadian they possibly can. Yeah. And oh my god, that's been true of since that band was, you know, 21 years old and just leaving McMaster University for the first time. <laughs> so that's, yeah, you gotta, like, playing live shows, connect with people, selling the merch, being there one-on-one. Yeah, and like, that's a th another, uh, I think that bands can, like, take away from this is that it's not just about the music. Like you can be a great musician, you can be, but if you're a dick or you're not able to connect with people and yeah. you're very aloof, it's not going to be easy for you. Like it's yeah. about that connection. If you make a friend and you connect with somebody, they're going to get excited about your shit because they know you. They know yeah. you as a person. They can get excited about you and your shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, like it, it helps, and I mean it'll honestly also like make the road experience a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. You can make those <laughs> friends in different cities. Like I know. I really like to become friends with these this one band, and, and last time they came down, we just went to go hang out. We went to uh, went to local before it shut down on 17th Ave, and we just hung out for a night. And he was like, "Dude, like I needed this because it's been a bit of a grind lately." And it was just it, it helps you to make 
to make friends. Yeah. And also, just yeah, it benefits everybody. Just make friends. Everyone likes being buds. Yeah. Be buds. I mean, unless you're intro introvert, in which case, like, make the right amount of friends. Yeah. Otherwise, you will hate your life. Yeah. Cut the line off. But if you're an extra extrovert, fuck it, man, go to town. Extra friends everywhere. <laughs> like, I, honestly, I consider myself an introvert. I still love making friends. Like. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's where you get your energy from. Yeah. So yeah. no, man, if, you, if make your friends, meet people, like. You, you, uh, the, the, your industry or your job will never disappear. I might not be in radio in two years, but I will still have every connection I've made with every person across this country that I've been lucky enough to, yeah. and that will never go away. Yeah, exactly. um, so, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I feel like we could talk for like another hour and 20 minutes. Probably. Has it been that long? <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's fine, dude. <laughs> but is there any just kind of final things you want to say? Oh man, thank you. This was so much fun. I had such a great time. Now I just want to play D and D with you. That's the other yeah, thing. Okay, so you have a rogue. That's kind of a shit disturber. What's your other character? Uh, warlock. What kind of warlock? Uh, kind of like a charismatic warlock who's more about like suggestion and charm and stuff like that. Okay. Very charming. Dark, warlock. dark, dark, spooky backstory. Yeah, he's actually supposed to. I hope that none of my D and D group listen to this, but. Curry ears, earmuffs, <laughs> yeah. earmuffs, kids. Put your earmuffs on. <laughs> earmuffs roll twenty group. <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed to be like I was kind of in cahoots with the DM, and we were gonna make him like an evil character. Fuck yeah, <laughs> that's the best. So I'm like subtly sabotaging the party throughout. <laughs> oh my god, that's so good. <laughs> Without them noticing. So. That's so good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's what. Cause yeah, so my other character I'm playing, the character I'm playing right now is a is a Asimar hexblade warlock, okay. which is super fun because like Asimar are kind of godly. And warlocks are fucking not. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's really fun to play, and uh, yeah, he's got like a sweet kopesh, like an Egyptian style sword that he used to stab people. Nice. He cast eldritch blast, which yeah. is always fun. So, oh god. Okay, so that, much eldritch blast. <laughs> right? It's either eldritch. So unless you're a hexblade, and then you can take like an improved pack weapon, and you can attack. So you can do two sword slashes. Okay. So you can either do your hexblade damage. Or like your elders blast, blasty blast, fun times, <laughs> or just stab stuff. Got to do in the middle. It's yeah. great. Well, it's okay, that's right. Yeah. But like I said, I make characters that the DM just hates. It's always like stuff like suggestion, charm, sleep, like all the crowd control stuff. That's just like have fun. Do things. I'm gonna wreck this encounter you built. Yeah. yeah. Don't hit me though because I'm weak as fuck. <laughs> My AC is 12. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> My health's not bad, but... <laughs> Wait, okay, what level? Uh, I think we're five or six. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah five, six is where you start to get some yeah. super dope spells. I think we just hit six, actually, yeah. Yeah, because I, I got a level seven Hexblade. Yeah. So we're getting close to level eight, but yeah. uh, there you go, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. That was my final question. <laughs> yeah. It was about goddamn D&D, &D, because it's the best. <laughs> it's how we started it off, so it's a good way to finish This it. is super fun, dude. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. <laughs> And scene, scene. <laughs> If you liked this episode of the podcast, why not leave a review? You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. For up-to-date information on the podcast, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can find us at Froggy Style Productions. That's Frog, the letter E, Style Productions. For more ways to support the show, visit fsproductions.ca.